So, it's now my honor to let you know that the governor's in the house. <laughs> you guys are all educated people. You read the newspapers. You listen to those silly polls. In fact, if any, you read the Star Ledger this morning, they told you all the reasons why you should be voting for Senator Barbara Bono for governor of New Jersey. They talked about everything that this guy has done to hurt us, to hurt the middle class, to hurt the people we care about, to hurt our students. And we have a candidate who is the epitome of a person who understands our values and our, our, our concerns, our livelihood. She understands that you don't take money out of the pockets of children or seniors. That you, it, it, it's amazing, it's mind-boggling that somebody who is so diametrically opposed to all the values New Jerseyans hold near and dear is leading in the polls. We need to make that stop. You're going to have an opportunity today to meet Senator Buono. You, I, I love her. I mean, I've been watching her campaign. I've been watching her career. She's an amazing person who really just isn't getting a fair shake right now, but she can get a fair shake on November 5th, and we are going to make that happen. You guys need to make sure that you talk to every one of your friends and neighbors. Don't be shy about it. Don't write her off. Don't give it up. She's going to win. And when she wins, we're going to have a New Jersey that we can be proud of. Not, not a stronger than the storm New Jersey. Not a New Jersey where you got some guy dancing around on the beach with his family saying, look at me. Not a New Jersey where you spend $15 million to have an election or $25 million to have an election so that he looks better than the other guy. He, doesn't, he, he wants to win by a larger margin. You're not going to have a New Jersey where he's... Where, where the, the governor is selling himself out to whatever party boss, irrespective of their criminal background or history, says, I'll endorse you. We're going to have a state where we have a governor who stands up for us and represents something we can all be proud of. And I want you to meet that governor right now. So, you're taping. My back, everyone. It is great to be here. I want to tell you that Peg Schaefer has a lot of courage. Peg Schaefer was the, after my home county of Middlesex, was the first chair to endorse my candidacy. Back then we thought we would have a primary, but you know, things worked out the way they did, and we were fortunate that we did not. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to talk to really sort of address what Peg had said because, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions on policy and, and I'll touch on that a bit. But I want to tell you a little bit about myself, but first, uh, I wanted to just commend uh, all of the candidates that are here, what, what amazing candidates for, for Sheriff, uh, for Senate, for the Assembly, I know Marie, is this Marie Corfield around here? No, this is not no. Marie. <laughs> Jerry Bowers. Hi, how are you doing? Okay. Uh, but um, really great candidates. And, uh, and I know with a, a, a county chair uh, like Peg Schaefer, you guys are in it to win. And we can do it. It's a matter of resources, I think, in, in Somerset County because the demographics are changing, as you know. So let me just say this. We are 16 days out. And Peg, whoever thought it would get here. I mean, it seemed like a, it was going to take a long time, and it's here in the blink of an eye. And some people might say, some people have said, that it's over. But let me tell you this, I've been in politics for 20 years, and New Jersey, and maybe it's just New Jersey, but New Jersey for sure, just starts focusing on elections three weeks out. And, you know, we have just gone up on television last week, we just went up, and the issue really for someone like me, even though I've been in the state legislature for 19 years, I was in the state assembly for seven, I was in the, I'm still in the Senate for 12, I was the majority leader, which is a statewide position, and budget chair. But the fact is, in terms of name recognition, in New Jersey, you know, we're caught in between New York and Philadelphia, media markets, and they really don't cover us. And so it's very unusual for a statewide candidate to run and have that kind of name recognition immediately. So that's really what we're up against. And that's what getting on TV will be able to accomplish for us. Because I can tell you this, we have had a strong grassroots effort starting from when I announced in February, formally announced. And we cut 10 points off of his lead in, in August without spending any money at all on paid advertising. And I attribute it to our strong, and Al Shema is part of it, a real, real um, strong group, a lot of volunteers, but some really integral staff that's actually paid. And Al Shema is one of them, and they've been you know, calling people up. And I have to tell you, it's been quite a progression initially. And, I, and we talked about it. I said, has it changed? in terms of the phone calls. Back in February and March when they called, people would say, Barbara? Barbara who? 
And so they have really have helped to build it. And it's been incremental, but I can tell you now, you know, it's kind of the velocity is going to, is it has been increasing uh, since the debates and now that we're up on TV. And it really is the last three weeks. So the key is not to be lulled into, uh, you know, I always say that um, uh, just being, you know, the defeatism that you hear in people's voices, they know apathy is our enemy. And, and I think that that's, that that's what we really have to remind people to get to the polls, that we need to hear their voices, we need their votes, and we need for them to get to the polls and tell their friends and neighbors. And, and let me just tell you a little bit about me so you don't think I'm just blowing hot air. As a woman in, in New Jersey politics, I have always been underestimated. When I first ran for the New Jersey General Assembly in 1994, Christine Todd Whitman, the Republican governor at the time, was at the height of her popularity. Remember the Florio backlash? Well, we were still in the aftermath of that. The Republicans had veto-proof majorities of both houses in the legislature. I ran. They said I couldn't do it. I won. And then I had to run the next year because it was just to serve out half of an assembly term. And they said, oh, it was an aberration. She'll never do it again. It was a fluke. I ran, and I won, and I brought along my running mate. And then I ran for the state senate in 2001, and they said it again. She'll never win. Been there, won that. And then, same thing. I gotta tell you, the intra-party stuff is a, is more hard, is, is a little more difficult to maneuver, which is why I thought it was interesting. Tom Moran has no idea what he's talking about in terms of politics. Because how did I become the first woman to chair the Senate Budget and Appropriations Committee in 2008? Let me tell you, I would, yeah, I would have seniority on the, it's a little, it's a funny story. Kind of, in retrospect. I was on the committee for the entire time I was in the legislature, so I had seniority. I was a very, I'm, I'm a lawyer, so I'm pretty good at cross examining people. And the chair of the budget committee was indicted, Sharp James. No, I'm sorry, Wayne Bryant. And then the, the vice chair, Sharp James, resigned. He was about to be indicted. And then two other people re just didn't run for re election that had seniority Bernie Kenny, the majority leader, and Joe Doria. So I had seniority. I thought that was how it worked, right? No. Sorry, I said I, I told Dick Cody, the Senate president at the time, that I wanted him to appoint me, and he said, and he didn't tell me, but it, I was told in no uncertain terms that there was a deal, and that there were two guys that had didn't didn't have seniority, and they were going to get. It. I remember my heart sinking, and then I said, wait, wait a second, what do you mean there's a deal? And I figured it out. Can I have the water? I figured it out. And um, I was able, and, and really, politics, the one thing I learned, probably the most, one of the most important lessons, excuse me, is that politics is about forming alliances and building relationships. And so I figured it out, and I was able to become the first woman to chair the Senate Budget and Appropriations Committee. And then again, in 2010, I became the first woman to um, be the second in command, as they say, in the Senate. I was the majority leader. And I was told then that I was, and I'll never forget, I'm not going to tell you who said it, but it was somebody, one of the bo bosses, and they said, Barbara, you're overplaying your hand. And said, okay. <laughs> exactly. Well, you said, I guess. You, was, you no. know, you probably know. But anyway, and so I fit, but anyway, this is a bigger mountain to climb, but you know, and, and it is, it is challenging the status quo, and I look to, you know, my, one of my heroines, probably the one I always think about um, in these last several months, is Shirley Chisholm. And I remember when she ran for president. She was the first African American to seek uh, the nomination of a major party in 1972. I just graduated high school. I was in college. And I'll never, she took that to courage. What I'm doing, that is nothing compared to what she did, right? And I remember she ran in the, fur, the face of this intense opposition, had no money. Uh, her party didn't, you know, was kind of on the fence with her too. That, that's a, that's generous. And I said, how did she? What what drove her to run? And I remember uh, reading some of her her um, work in in the aftermath. And she said, and I, this is this is my mantra. She said she ran in the face of what appeared to be insurmountable odds because of a sheer refusal to accept the status quo. And so when I was interviewed by Tom Moran and he was asking me questions about certain party bosses, and I said, Tom, this is what happens when you challenge the status quo. When you try and, and you know, 
crack the glass ceiling, so it's, it's really more of a concrete ceiling. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to get there. But I, I just want you to know, do not underestimate me. Uh, I am focused, I have a plan, and um, you know, I, I never ever give up. I never have. You know, and let me tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I had to get my sea legs pretty early in life. My father was an Italian immigrant. He came to this country when he was three. His parents, uh, my grandparents spoke no English, had little formal education, but they knew if they came to the United States that their son would have opportunity. And so now today, the daughter of James Buono, an Italian immigrant butcher who dropped out of high school, is running for governor of the state of New Jersey. Now that's the American dream. It's the belief that regardless of what your circumstances may dictate today, that your children and their children can hope for a better tomorrow. And that fight for a better tomorrow is, is why I'm running. And so I, I know what it's like to, I am the little guy. You know, my dad died when I was 19. I was on my own. My mom couldn't cope. And I literally was on my own. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. But the point is, I, you know, I, I am the little guy. I am the underdog. And I'm fine with that. I embrace it. But if anybody thinks I'm ever going to give up or I'm somebody to be trifled with or underestimated, they're making a serious mistake. And I mean that in the best sense of, you know, I'm not, you know, it is what it is. And uh, when Chris Christie said at the debate, the second debate at Montclair State, I thought it was interesting when I said what I was saying just now. He said, oh, no, I think you're a formidable candidate. I said, well, at least we agree on something. <laughs> And, that, and speaking of the debate, I don't know, did any of you see the, either of the debates? Yes. yes. Okay, yes. yeah. Well, I, I, don't, I guess you heard the moderator asked him, uh, you know, they challenged him on his bullying, and they said, you know, is, what, what about this bullying, name-calling, you know, he called the veteran an idiot, and, you know, the teacher's thug, et cetera, et cetera. So, I should, you know, I don't, even, you don't want to say it in front of the child, because really, I mean, I'm serious, I don't want my children to emulate that. And he said it was strong leadership. He said yeah. it, that's what he had with a straight face. He said it was strong leadership. And that's just, he is who he is, and he's not going to change. He's consistent. And if that wasn't bad enough, when they asked him if he was planning on running for president, he said, well, you know, and he's so sarcastic. Oh, I could walk and chew gum at the same time. And so I said, well, Governor, which is running New Jersey, walking or chewing gum? And he didn't answer. He didn't answer. <laughs> But the fact is that really confirmed what we already knew. You know, he's all over the country telling everyone how great we're doing in New Jersey, even though we have 400,000 out of work. We have the highest, you know, he criticized his predecessor, John Corzine, and I watched the debates from 2009, and he criticized him saying, we have the highest unemployment in the region. Well, four years later, we still have the highest unemployment in the region, higher than New York, not just New York. Connecticut, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. This governor has been an abysmal failure on the economy. And no amount of YouTube videos and choreographed town halls and late night wisecracks on David Letterman can erase the fact that, well, well, that the economy is failing and he has no plan for that. And I'll be happy to answer your questions. But when you talk about social issues, I mean, he's on par with, I don't know, Sarah Palin or the <laughs> Iowa Republican Caucus. I mean, so um, uh, the fact of the matter is we need a change. We, there's so much at stake. We cannot afford to have the next four years mirror the last four years. And, um, you know, whether it's social issues, he's the first governor since Roe v. Wade that's anti-choice. He thinks that politicians are better suited to make our health care decisions than we are. And I have a problem with that. He doesn't think women should get equal pay for equal work. He vetoed um, a pay equity bill calling it senseless bureaucracy. Um, you know what he's, where he is with women's health. Every single year he's been in office, he slashed, he zeroed out state funding for Planned Parenthood. And I think it didn't, I think the one, one in Somerset County closed, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it did. Yes, I yeah. have a friend who was Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. Six of them closed. In and what that means is 33,000 women will not be getting the health care that they need, the mammograms, the pap smears, the, the preventive cancer screenings that they need. And when it comes to guns, I mean, this is the thing. They asked me the question, and when I, I responded <coughs> to the question of him running for president. And I said, and I'll say it again, it really doesn't bother me that he's running for president. It bothers me how he's running for president. Every decision he makes is calibrated by how it will play on the conservative base of the National Republican Party. And I was about to talk about guns. Back in April, he, he came up with the idea to ban 50 caliber rifles 
which would pierce any kind of body armor. I've seen the, the rounds are about that long. And um, they would down a helicopter. Apparently, it can hit a target from a mile away. You don't even have to be a trained shooter. And uh, he, he came up with the idea. So he was for it before he was against it, because when we passed it, we sent it to his desk, and he vetoed it. Well, you may ask, what happened in those months in between? Well, I'll tell you what happened. Pro-Gun New Hampshire sent him a letter and told him, in a warning really, in no uncertain terms, that if he signed that legislation, that they would actively work against him in the New Hampshire Republican primary. And so what bothers me is that he's running for president, sacrificing the safety of our children and our communities, sacrificing women's health, because we know the National Republican Party has got this issue with Planned Parenthood. I'm not sure where that comes from. And sacrificing, uh, you know, the, the 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 civil rights of our gay brothers and sisters, and the the list goes on and on. And I could talk about the economy, but just briefly, the sum and substance of this governor's economic plan, which has landed us in the bottom of the barrel in job growth and economic growth, is to give 2.1 billion dollars, a record number of tax credits, to large corporations, and they haven't delivered the quality or quantity of jobs that we need. So part of, I have a very detailed economic plan on buonoforgovernor.com, as well as other specific platform pieces, but suffice it to say that I would examine those 2.1 billion dollars of tax credits because there's no oversight and there's no accountability so we don't even know if what we're getting for we know we're not getting the jobs that we're promised and I would redirect some of those tax credits to the small businesses in New Jersey that have been left behind do you know that in New Jersey and even I was surprised at this statistic when I read it almost 95 of our businesses are small businesses they're the ones that are crying out, out for help that need access to capital. You know, I did a, um, some retail politics, as we call it, in Essex County yesterday, and I walked the business districts in North, East Orange, Orange, Irvington, and I talked to the business owners, and I said, I asked them, well, you know, do you need access to capital? And, and, I, and they were saying, yes, please, we need you. We, we, get, we get no help from this governor. And so that will rebuild our economy. That will uh, create jobs for people in the communities to put those 400,000 people out of work so New Jersey doesn't lag the nation in economic growth. And, you know, he's made so many decisions that are, that are really calibrated by his politics. He pulled the plug on the arc tunnel. Now, we know that he gave a reason that it was a false. It was false. He said, oh, we can't, oh, the federal government came up with a new cost estimate, and it shows that New Jersey is going to be stuck with holding the bag for the cost overages. Well, indeed, that was not the case, because the government accounting office from the federal government, a couple months after he pulled the plug on ARC, uh, said that that wasn't true, that there was no new cost estimate. In fact, the, the DOT commissioner from the federal government came and tried to um, assuage our fears. Um, so again, we deserve better in New Jersey, we really do. And so this is what I ask you to do in the next 16 days. Talk to your friends, tell them that we need, that if they want to change, and just tell them to go to bornoforgovernor.com if they're not convinced. If they want a change, they just can't hope for it and wish for it, they have to work for it. And so tell them that it is time to take back New Jersey. This is our New Jersey. This is not Chris Christie's New Jersey. And if we do it, and I know you all know how to do it. You're the activist. We do it county by county, town by town, block by block, street by street, house by house. And that's how we're doing it. And we're building back the Democratic Party in New Jersey from the ground up. And so I just want to thank you for coming, for giving me the patience and the time uh, on a Sunday afternoon. And And, I, and yes, thank you. I, she's, I wanted to thank, I didn't want to forget thanking you, because oh. I do sometimes. And I, have, I want to thank our hostess, Joan. Where are you? That's why, because I, I, I was saying I was looking for it. And I to, thank you so much. Really beautiful party party. What a nice spread. Thank you so much.